There's a stirring deep within me. Could it be my time has come? When I see my gracious Savior face to face when all is done. Is that his voice I am hearing? Come away, my precious one. Is he calling me? Is he calling me? I will rise up, rise up, and I'll bow down, bow down and lay my crown at his wounded feet. stirring deep within me could it be my time has come when i see my gracious savior face to face when all is done is that his voice i am hearing come away my precious one is he calling me see you here, especially if you're visiting with us. Uh, you bless us by being with us, and I'm, I'm glad you're here. Give us an opportunity to, uh, to meet you, and we hope you come back at every opportunity. This year is still brand new. It's busy, a lot of challenges, uh, some problems, um, just general busyness, but it's good to take a break from that and gather as a body of the Lord's believers and raise songs of praise to him and, and to hear from his word. Uh, Marna and I have, uh, we've had three preschool grandkids with us last night. I am just thankful to be here. <laughs> and I want to add my sincere appreciation to all the volunteers in the nursery and the preschool. Dr. Scott Sager is with us again this morning. He has been a blessing. He has shared some wonderful things with us in class this morning already and uh, over the uh, recent weeks. He started a series last week on the Gospel of John, challenged us with some thoughts from Joshua as well, to be strong and courageous and to have the spirit of Joshua and to seize the moment, especially the mission moments. And I'm looking forward to hearing him again this morning. If you, uh, if you haven't already, please fill out a card. Uh, otherwise, join with us as we praise the Lord this morning. I was talking with the young adults this morning in class, and the guys um, and I were talking about the function of the opening prayer. What's, what's the purpose of, of, of having an opening prayer? And, and they believe it's my job to get all y'all's minds where they need to be in order to enter into worship. That's a tall order. Um, so I'm just going to hedge with praying over the Barnabas list, and I'm hoping that that will center you and get you ready for worship today. So uh, let's pray together. Father God, what an honor it is to come before you uh, to lead my brothers and sisters in these meditative thoughts. Uh, centering around your sovereignty and your grace. 
And Father, um, I just thank you for being able to do life with this church um, in all its many forms and fashions. Father, we've got some brothers and sisters that uh, need an extra special measure of your presence today. We we're mindful of Brian Price, and we ask that you will help him in his treatment. God, um, continue to give energy to that family, and um, I pray that this new treatment slows the progress, maybe even reverses the progress of this disease. Father, I lift up Megan to you, and I pray for her and her family. God, I pray for patience and perseverance. I pray for deliverance. And I pray, God, that, that we will not give up on praying for this family. Uh, Father, I thank you for Ed Edgen and Linda Horton and Tommy. And I pray for uh, those folks. Um, be with them and, and their caregivers too, Father, as they uh, try and maintain and expand quality of life there. Uh, Father, thank you for the privilege of getting to meet Mason this last week. And I pray that you bless him as he's only a few days old now, Lord. Um, give Chris and Brittany strength to, to be good parents and uh, lots of energy in these first few months. Uh, Father, we lift up uh, Stan and uh, the loss of his mother. God, I pray uh, that you will heal his heart, and I pray that you um, will walk with him in these months of adjustment. Um, God, we lift up Travis Snyder. We thank you for Jerry and Pat and um, Justin and Amanda and the work that they had, d had done for us in Ecuador. And we just pray now for their son, Travis. Uh, be with those doctors and help, help Travis to hold tight to you in, um, in what lies ahead. Uh, God, we lift up Steve Shelton, Patricia Irwin, Tommy Price, Campbell Dale, and Marsha Ray. Father, we're, we're also thankful because we've got lots of soon-to-be mamas in this room um, with lots of babies expected. And so I pray over those ladies um, and their pregnancies, Father. And, and lastly, we don't want to forget uh, Roberta Bradley, Marie Greer, and Lucy Kephart, who can't be with us today. Father, um, encourage them and surround them with folks that love them because they can't be here to get the love and encouragement and support that so readily flows from, um, from our congregation. And, and finally, Father, I lift up Linda as she, uh, Linda Laird, as she's still in the hospital right now uh, with that knee surgery. God, um, give Glenn strength and um, help us to love on that family in their time of need. Uh, bless our worship, Father. May the songs honor your name. Um, speak through Scott this morning, too, as we talk about who we are in Christ. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked them, him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Elijah the prophet, I am the voice of the one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. Slain from the foundations of the world for sin. Crucified, oh holy sacrifice, behold the Lamb of God, behold the Lamb, crown him, crown him, worthy is the Yeah. Uh -huh. 
day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. All who are thirsty, all who are weak, Come to the fountain, dip your heart in the stream of life, let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy, as deep cries out to said of him, here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God descending and ascending on the Son of Man. Let's stand together. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Watch the waters part before us now. Watch the waters part before us now. Come and see what He has done for us. Tell the world that His great love our God is. A God who saves, our God is a God who saves. Let God arise, let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever, He reigns now and forever. Oh. 
holds the keys of life, our Lord, death has no sting. You'll find a word, our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Let God arise, let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Arise, let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever. He reigns now and forever. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Our God is a God who saves. Our God. A God who saves, let God arise, let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever, He reigns now and forever. Arise, let God arise. Our God reigns now and forever, He reigns now and forever. Let God arise. Be seated. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs. Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. We gather here in Jesus' name His love is burning in our hearts like living flame for through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here. Everyone belongs. Finding our forgiveness here. the bread. The Lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Soon, where angels sing, 
see the glory of our Lord and coming King. Now we anticipate the feast for which we wait. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the I had prepared some remarks for communion, and then something amazing happened yesterday that totally changed what I wanted to say to you, church. Steve Krieger and I are coaching a six and under basketball team, and if anybody's ever had the opportunity to do that, you don't realize what joy you get from spending time with five and six-year-olds teaching them the game of basketball. We had a game yesterday, and it was a barn burner. We only won one game all year, but it was 15 to 15, and we were in the game. And with nine seconds left, the ball fell to my son's feet, and he took off with the ball, and he dribbled the length of the court, and time stood still for me. <laughs> and about the free throw line, he stopped, and he shot the ball, and it hit the rim and bounced off. But by providence, it came right to his feet. And with one second left, he released the shot, it banked off the backboard, and went in. And we won the game at the buzzer. And then something amazing happened. A semi-respectable adult became a six-year-old kid again, and I ran on the court, chased my son down, and picked him up in the air, and lost my mind in the moment. But the reason why that was important to me is because the joy I experienced there of spending that moment with my son gave me a glimpse of the joy our Heavenly Father experiences when we come into communion together. Now, how do I know this? Because I know that we are made in His image. When we experience love, when we experience joy, we get a small taste of how He feels about us. When we all get together, for example, and slow down our lives for this family meal, it reminds us of the body of believers that we are. It reminds us about who we belong to. And we get to experience a little bit of the joy our Heavenly Father feels when we slow down and take the time to come together and worship Him and commune with Him. Please pray with me. Dear God, we are so grateful for your love for us. We get to experience a small part of that when we look at our children and share a cup of coffee with a friend or get a thank you note from a, a neighbor. We get to see glimpses of, of the joy that, that you experience when we come and stop and worship you. Lord, as we commune with you right now, and we know you're here in our presence, help us to remember what you did for us the sacrifice you made on the cross, the blood that you shed, so that we could be with you in heaven, Father. Thank you for your love for your children. Please forgive us of our sins. In your son's name I pray, amen.
Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share. Now, in case you were wanting to finish the story, ever steady Steve Krigger did not run on the court. <laughs> he kept his composure and acted like an adult, but he was smiling from ear to ear with his love for Adam and the joy he felt for Adam. As Adam explained later, he was a butter bean, not a buzzer beater. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, we are... Um, so grateful that we are your children and we see that we are your children through the eyes of our kids. When we see the joy that they experience, whether it's in school or a game of sports, we get a small glimpse into your love for us as your children. Thank you for that gift. Lord, we are so honored and, and humbled that we can share this meal with you. Thank you for uh, just the ability to come here and slow down our week and commune with you. Please be with us as we, we leave the church later today. Help us to commune with you throughout the week, that it doesn't stop here, but that we take time to have a meal with you and let you into our hearts. In your son's name I pray, amen. And these are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. 
And these are the days of your servant, Moses, righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword, still we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. servant, David rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are wide in the world, and we are the laborers in your vineyard, declaring the word of the Lord, behold he comes, riding on clouds. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion till salvation comes. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet calls, so lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion till salvation comes. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 So lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of sight till salvation comes. Who was, and who is, and who is to come? Who was, and who is, and who is to come? Who Good morning, everyone. I'm Scott Sager. It's great to be with you again today. If you have a Bible, uh, grab it and turn to John chapter 2. We'll be there in just a minute. We've kind of got a little work to do in John chapter 1 as we're kind of working towards uh, chapter 2 today. Some of you have heard there's a television show called The Voice. And uh, I didn't win that show. I've never even been on that show. Uh, I don't sing very well, and you might even find that out today. But uh, on this show, The Voice, there are these four people who are really talented singers, and they're going to take some people and, and take them to the top. And the way they decide who they want is they, they turn their chairs around, and if they like what they hear, they hit this red button, and they hit the red button, and it spins their chair around, and they get to find out who's singing. Well, if you could just imagine this. They've got their chairs turned around. And they're listening to this voice, and it kind of sounds like this. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. And they think, man, that's not very good, but it's kind of, <laughs> kind of mysterious. 
prepare ye the way. So they hit the red button to spin around because they want to figure out who is this guy. And they spin their chairs around, and the one singing that song looks like Haggard from Harry Potter. I mean, he's got this big beard, and he's wearing these camel skins. He's got a leather belt around his waist. I mean, he's eating locusts and wild honey when he's not singing. And he's calling everyone, prepare the way of the Lord. And they think, who is this guy? And so they ask him, who are you? And just to be mysterious, he says, I'm the voice. And they say, no, this is the television show, The Voice. And he says, no, I'm the voice. The voice calling in the wilderness, get right, because the Lord is coming. And all of a sudden, he says, I am here to point the word. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Go and follow him when you see him. And so he pointed the earliest disciples to Jesus. And they went and they followed after Jesus. And as they're following after Jesus, Jesus is walking along and All of a sudden, you know there's people following you, so he turns around and he says, Hey guys, what is it that you want? And in every gospel, it's always important to notice what are the first words that Jesus says. What are the first words that come out of his mouth in a gospel? In John's gospel, it's this. What do you want? Isn't that a great question? Let's assume he's asking that of you this morning. What do you want? The earliest disciples, they're taken aback and they say, well, we want to know where you're hanging out. Where where are you abiding? Where are you staying? And he said, come on and you'll see. And so they spent the day with Jesus. He gave them a new name. He gave them a new story. He gave them a new perspective on life. And so they went and found their friends and said, hey, we've met the Messiah. Come and see. And so they came. And they began to hang out with Jesus. John chapter 2. Jesus gets invited to a wedding. How many of you get excited about being invited to a wedding? Be honest. You're in church. So, you know, it's funny. When I got married... I used to kid people that, you know, the wedding, if you were going to have one of those billboards, you know, it was the wedding starring in big letters, Suzanne Matula, and then co-starring her mother, Anne Matula, and then down here in that little bitty print, also featuring (laughs) Scott Sager. We all know about weddings. You get invited to a wedding. Well, Jewish weddings were a bigger deal because they lasted a week. A week. And this one's happening in Cana. Jesus is from Nazareth. Cana's just down the road, three or four miles, not far at all. And what we discover from church history is that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is somehow related to the bridegroom. Probably a nephew. And so she's there not just to attend, but she's helping to put the thing on. And so Jesus gets invited, and by custom, he gets to invite his disciples. And so they all come for the festivity. It's a Wednesday when the wedding starts. And here's how it starts. All the men meet at the bridegroom's house. And they've got their torches, and they've got their trumpets, And they've got their noisemakers, and they've got a chair, and they throw the bridegroom-to-be in the chair, and they hoist him up in the air, and they march him through the streets, and they bang the drums, and they play the horns, and they just make a lot of noise. And they have this big festival, lie, 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 as they dance through the city, going to the bride's house. And so this whole big group arrives 
<coughs> excuse me, at the bride's house, and everybody waits outside while the bridegroom goes inside. And it's inside the bride's house that the wedding, the ceremony actually takes place. And you're thinking, you mean they didn't have to go to the ceremony, they just got to go to the party? That's the way it was back then. And so they all waited outside, and finally out came the bride and the groom and their family, and now they have two chairs. And they put the bride and the bridegroom in the chairs, and everybody marches back through the city to the bridegroom's house, singing and dancing and making merry. Can you picture Jesus doing that? It's important that you can picture Jesus having a good time at a party. He's a part of this wedding. He's having fun just like everybody else. And Wednesday, there's this great celebration. On Thursday, they consummate the marriage. And on Friday, the kind of the crescendo of the wedding, Mary and the others begin to look around. Guys, where's the wine? You mean we've drank that much wine? We got to get some more wine. I mean, in Jesus' day, there are two drinks of choice. There's wine and there's water. Now, how many of you have ever been to a wedding where they put water in the punch bowl? Mm Mm-mm. Or to celebrate, you popped an Ozarka. Uh Uh-uh. I mean, water is the most precious drink on the planet. But when you're celebrating something big, you got to have something else. We're out of wine. The Jews said, where there is no wine, there is no joy. That's how big of a deal wine is. You know, my wife, I think I told you, her name's Matula. That's Czech. And so when we got married, it was funny. They had this polka band, and they played this song, and they sang it in Czech. And I was like, what? What are they singing? And uh, all of a sudden, my uh, grandfather-in-law said, just wait. They'll sing it in English, so it's oompa, 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 you know. the. And finally, they got to English, and it went like this. Ready? In heaven, there is no beer That's why we have to drink it all down here. (laughs) When we are gone from here, our friends will be drinking all the beer. And I thought, hmm, interesting. So I grew up on punch, you know? And, uh, but the whole idea behind the song, you know, whether it's Czech or it's Jewish, Nobody was trying to promote drunkenness. What they were trying to promote is celebration. That there's a time when you're supposed to celebrate. When it's supposed to be about joy. It's supposed to be about uh, just enjoying the, everything that God is doing in this moment. And Mary is saying, hey, we got a problem. There's no more wine. So what do they do? They send somebody with a wheelbarrow back up to the vineyard and say, what do you got? Give us anything you got. I don't even care if it's grape juice. Just, we don't have anything. They're going door to door. You got any wine? We need wine. There's no Sam's. There's no Costco. They don't know where to turn. Then one of them remembered that there was this prophecy from Jeremiah that said that when the Messiah comes, he will usher in a time of great wine. And they began to pray, if only the Messiah was here. And that got Mary to thinking, hmm. And she left, and she went outside, and she found Jesus. Jesus, come here. Come here. Her lips quivering, there's a tear in her eye. Jesus, We're out of wine. This is going to be a debacle. An embarrassment. The whole community is going to say that this guy can't provide for his family. 
He's going to walk down the street and people are going to say, there goes the guy that couldn't even throw his own wedding. Jesus looked at his mother and said words I've never been strong enough to say. Woman, what is this to me? And what's interesting is in the text, Mary doesn't say another word. Mary, the mother of the Lord, stares down the Son of God. And pretty soon he smiles. There's a wink. And Mary turns to the servants and says, Hey, whatever he tells you, do it. Jesus looks around. There's six stone water pots. And he says, Guys, let's fill these things. So back and forth to the well they go, filling these six stone pots, 25 gallons each. And when they're full and everybody's exhausted, Jesus said, okay, scoop some up. Take it to the man who's in charge of the wedding. So they scoop a little out. And they take it to the man who's in charge of the wedding. He pours some in his glass. Whatever they do when they do this. And he tastes it. Wow. And he goes looking for the groom. Hey, you know, most people, the best stuff they've got, they give it to people while their taste buds are still all intact. But you've saved the best until now. And John says that with this story began the signs that we're looking at from the Gospel of John. In verse 11 it says, this was the first of his miraculous signs. He performed it at Cana, and thus he revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. What do we need to learn from this story that can help us? First of all, There's a problem. There's no more wine. And the best thing they do in this story is realize that when there's a problem, see Jesus. They tried to go to Costco. They tried everywhere else. But at some point, you have to just say, you know what? When I got a problem, see Jesus. He's the place to turn. And the problem here is emptiness. Emptiness. We got a problem. Things are empty that need to be full. And here's what most of us have discovered about life. The things that we thought were going to bring fulfillment haven't fulfilled us. You remember when you got the new car and you thought it was going to fulfill you? Only to discover that it didn't. Or when you bought the new house. Now when you walk through, you see where all the crooked points are. Or when you got the promotion and you, got, you thought, now that will fulfill. And it hasn't. You see, like in this story, every one of us knows what it's like to feel empty inside. We know what it's like to not have hope. We know what it's like to feel like we're all alone and we don't know how we're going to solve the mess that we're in. See Jesus. But here's what we discover. Only Jesus can take what's empty and make it full and make it better 
than we ever imagined it could be. So here's what we discover. When we're empty, God has us right where he wants us. When we're desperate, God has us right where he has planned for us to be. Because Augustine said there's a God-shaped hole in the heart of every person and only the love of God can fill it. In Romans 5 verse 5, Paul says, through the Holy Spirit, God has poured his love into our hearts. And it's the only thing that can fill an empty pot and make it something better. So where are you this morning? What do you need to hear? If you're empty, there's an opportunity for God to fill. If you're in despair, see Jesus. He'll give you hope. If you're in an embarrassing predicament, it's preparation for God to do something good in you. Please notice that this is the first of the miraculous signs that Jesus will do. And it's odd to me that he, he picks something like a wedding to do it. It's odd to me until I begin to understand that behind this story is a realization that this is a third day story. You see how it starts? On the third day, a wedding took place. We know great things happen on the third day. We're people of the cross. And when Jesus told his mother, my time has not yet come, that becomes code all the way through the gospel until he gets to the cross where he says, now my time has come. This is all a story that's trying to tell us what God did at the cross makes this story different. What God did at the cross is that he took those ceremonial pots that were filled with water and he said water will never do it. It needs to be blood. And God's going to send his son. And if you'll understand that, and if you'll turn your eyes upon Jesus, if you'll let him have his way with you, if you'll invite him into your heart, if you'll ask him to abide with you, he'll take your empty life. He'll take your disappointment. He'll take your heartbreak. And he'll fill you again. But he'll fill you with a joy that's better than what you ever imagined you could have. Nobody fills my heart like Jesus. Nobody loves me like he does. So where are you turning today? The one who did the miracle at the wedding loves to do a miracle with hearts. And he'd like to take yours and fill it with the love of God. If you've never given your life to Christ, now's the time to do it. But for a lot of us, we've invited Jesus into our heart. And we need to be honest and tell him, I'm feeling empty right now. The things I thought would satisfy don't satisfy. And I need to lean upon you. And here's the truth. If you'll ask him, Christ will come and fill your heart again in a way like you've never experienced before. Ask him to come and have his place there and to fill your heart. And let's let that relationship be the one that drives us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the word at the wedding that reminds us that when we're empty, that the love of God is there to fill us again. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the power of the resurrection. And we thank you for the absolute certainty we have that things that are empty can be filled with the love of Christ. 
because there was a tomb that was empty that spoke to us all about the power of the resurrection and the power that's available to change lives even today. And so we ask for Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we minister to you this morning? Can we encourage you in any way? That's why we're here. And we invite you to the front as we stand and sing this song together. All who are thirsty, all who are weak, come to the fountain. Dip your heart in the stream of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy. As he cries out to you were here today. Thanks for being here so much. As we close, a few reminders as always. Uh, don't forget that we'll be back here tonight at 5 o'clock for our spring service, um, our monthly instrumental service. Uh, the 39ers are planning lunch trip to Athens on January the 22nd. You can check the bulletin for more information. There's a baby shower Sunday, January the 25th for Jason and Sonny Holman from 1.30 to 3 in the Mercy Building. Uh, some of you are planning to sing in the chorus for Easter, and we're asking about practice today. We're not starting today, uh, but we will be starting next week or the week after, so make plans for that. And our guest speaker next week will be Art Leslie. Was anybody cold this morning? It was cold. I don't know why, but I'll get to work on it. Just wanted to acknowledge that. Hopefully it's warm in our hearts. Thanks for being here. We hope you have a great week, and uh, we'll close in prayer. Let's pray together. Holy Father, you're so good to us, and we're just thankful to be considered your children. We're humbled, and uh, we're in awe of your, your goodness. And Father, you are truth and light, and it's our heart's desire to, to pursue you in everything we do. Father, we ask that you'll help us to focus on you, help us to uh, filter out the, the distractions of this world, to uh, draw, draw near to you each and every day. And uh, most of all, Father, we thank you for your son Jesus and your spirit that uh, helps us along the way. And it's through Jesus we pray. Amen.